My name is David Nichols, and this presentation is a synopsis of the analytical research that the DMT Nexus has carried out into the phytochemistry of ayahuasca uh, vines, admixtures, and analog plants. The DMT Nexus is an online community focused on exploring DMT, ayahuasca, and other entheogenic preparations. The Nexus aims to increase awareness about the use and extraction of psychedelic compounds to help people acquire the skills to grow and extract their own entheogenic plants and substances, and to maintain an environment conducive to open dialogue on important topics relating to entheogens. Through the creation of such an environment, the Nexus seeks to encourage an ongoing exchange of ideas with the goal of furthering research into psychedelic compounds. The DMT Nexus Wiki, the Coalition for Entheogenic Liberty, or CELL, and the Sustainable Nexus are three ongoing pro uh, projects uh, in the realms of harm reduction, awareness, and sustainability that I don't have time to go into at the moment, but would love to talk with anyone about after this presentation. The Collaborative Research Project is one of the Nexus's newest projects and came to being at a time where much of the advancements in extraction techniques had been uh, brought to the forefront. Most of the techniques used has been refined multiple times and we had reached a point where we realized that our knowledge re uh, regarding the actual plants used in ayahuasca preparations both in traditional settings and throughout the world had uh, presented significantly more holes in the total sum of knowledge that we had. In an attempt to rectify that we began to uh, collect knowledge and compile it into multiple threads, focusing on the key elements of different plants and procedures. Phytochemical analysis is perhaps the very backbone of the collaborative research project, and the main uh, techniques that the Nexus utilizes in this procedure are gas and liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry and thin layer chromatography, which are both methods for uh, separating and detecting various molecular components of a given plant extract. All of this analytical research is done in collaboration with Energy Control, a Spanish harm reduction agency. With regards to ayahuasca, it seems as though individuals from uh, industrial contexts seem very fixated on the DMT component of the brew. This makes sense given the incredibly profound and powerful effects of DMT, but is far from the full story. While many people seem to view harmala alkaloids as little more than physiological keys to unlock the body's chemistry and allow for DMT to be orally active, harmala alkaloids are incredibly potent and have their own uh, psychoactive effects, which are frequently ignored or at least downplayed. Um, I would call your attention to the fact that the Santo Daime and other groups refer to the Banisteriopsis capi and related vines as the ayahuasca vines, additionally referring to the ayahuasca vines as the power while the DMT admixture is presented as the light. Uh, for those who are interested in more than semantic uh, distinctions, I would again point to the fact that especially at higher doses, harmala alkaloids are incredibly psychoactive in their own right and lend a very unique nature to the uh, experience. There's a lot of botanical confusion and misidentification uh, among ethnobotanical vendors, uh, less or so among botanists, but uh, many of the plants being presented are uh, within genera that are some of the hardest to identify species within. And this becomes important because it has come to our attention that while there are a number of Banisteriopsis vines containing harmalas, there are also vines that appear to contain unknown compounds. In that vein, uh, I present uh, four major vines that have come to be sold in the ethnobotanical marketplace. Uh, Banisteriopsis capi, which is frequently marketed as yellow capi or yellow ayahuasca. Banisteriopsis miraceta, which is frequently marketed as red capi or red ayahuasca. And then the non harmala containing vines of Tetrapterus methistica and Alicia anisopetala, respectively gray and black ayahuasca. Banisteriopsis capi is perhaps the most commonly known ayahuasca vine and is generally what's referred to when people discuss ayahuasca within uh, industrial contexts. 
Generally speaking, it contains harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine. However, the alkaloids present in the vine may differ somewhat from the vines uh, from the alkaloids present uh, present within the brew, owing to the fact that harmine can be reduced to harmaline and harmaline can be reduced to tetrahydroharmine when exposed to heat over prolonged periods of time. There are two non-published varietals of Banisteriopsis capi, variety Kalpari and variety Tokanaka. Uh, variety Kalpari has frequently been presented as having a higher alkaloid content than variety Tokanaka and can be distinguished by its uh, relatively bulbous morphological expressions on the vine, whereas Tokanaka is a smooth stemmed. As I said, this can be sold as yellow ayahuasca, but color names should essentially not be used for the purposes of identification. This is the analysis of a Banisteriopsis copy vine that was marketed as yellow ayahuasca. Um, the position of the spikes on the vertical axis, uh, or sorry, on the horizontal axis indicate the uh, chemical compound and the height of those spikes on the vertical axis present their relative abundance. Um, so in this particular vine, all that was present was harmine and tetrahydroharmine. However, in this vine, which was marketed as black ayahuasca, um, harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine are all present, which is notably different than the alkaloid profile for uh, Tetrapterus, or sorry, for Alicia anisopetala, which is cons uh, consistently referred to as black ayahuasca in much of the established literature. Banisteriopsis mericata has a very similar alkaloid profile to Banisteriopsis capi and is also uh, in the same genus. Our analysis has found only harmine and tetrahydroharmine within the vine, but again, that could be very different in the brews. Um, one of the very interesting characteristics of this vine is that even prior to reduction, the brews are dark red, which contrasts with the light yellow to muted gold of unreduced Banisteriopsis capi brews. There's speculation by Christian Raish and others that this particular vine uh, contains DMT in the leaves and that it may be possible to brew um, an orally active uh, ayahuasca brew from just the components of this one plant. We are currently in the process of obtaining leaves to confirm the uh, chemical constituents. Here's our analysis of uh, the Banisteriopsis mericata sample we had. Uh, we found harmine and tetrahydroharmine and a potential plant sterol or fatty acid chain. Tetrapterus methistica uh, is a vine that was described by Richard Evan Schultes in his time with the Macu tribe in Brazil. Um, as a result of capsizing in his canoe when he was returning from an expedition, he lost his only sample of this vine. And as far as we know, we have carried out the first analysis since his documentation of this species. Uh, Dr. Alexander Shulgin hypothesized that harmala alkaloids were present in this vine in a 1966 paper on meristicin based solely on the subjective experiences of a number of people who had taken this vine. However, when we analyzed this species, we were unable to match any of the uh, compounds present with any chemicals contained within the National Institutes of Standards and Technology uh, database, which contains over 40,000 chemical compounds. The literature states that this brew or this vine is traditionally brewed via cold water decoction and is not utilized with any admixture plants. This, of course, raises questions both to the effects of heat on the alkaloid or uh, chemical compounds found in this vine, as well as whether or not it uh, exhibits any MAOI activity. Alicia anisopetala is another vine for which we believe we've carried out the first known analysis, and similarly with the Tetrapterus methistica, we were unable to identify any compounds within this vine. Um, we don't know what the traditional uses of this vine are, if there are any, and this vine actually came to our attention as the result of several botanical vendors who began to make it available. Uh, subsequently, several individuals ingested this and, and claimed that while it generated experiences similar to harmala alkaloids or Banisteriopsis vines, at similar subjective effects, or at the point where they felt that had they ingested uh, enough harmal alkaloids, they would have inhibited MAO, they found that this vine was not able to make uh, DMT orally active. 
However, it was suggested by somebody who initially worked with this uh, in relation with one of the vendors who made it available, that either large quantities of this vine are needed and or they need to uh, be reduced for a significant period of time until it re reaches a very thick consistency. Either way, there are significantly more questions that need to be uh, asked about this vine. For the purpose of the nexus analysis uh, into ayahuasca admixtures, we have focused solely on DMT containing admixtures rather than getting into uh, the additions of plants such as tobacco and detora. And as with the vines, there has been a lot of botanical misidentification and confusion by various vendors. Diplopterus cabarana is a plant that has been talked about at some length as generating subjectively different experiences than uh, Psychotria viridis when brewed with Banisteriopsis capi. And many people have postulated that this is result to what they believe to be a 5-MeO DMT content. While previous analyses have shown only trace amounts of 5-MeO DMT, our analysis was unable to find any 5-MeO DMT within samples from this particular vendor. Uh, here is the mass spectrometry from that, where the main peak is DMT, and while the lower peaks were not individually analyzed, they were cross-referenced with, with, with standards for bifotenin and 5-MeO uh, DMT, and all came back negative, leading us to conclude that there was no 5-MeO DMT in this particular sample. Any baby carbolines in the leaves of that one? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I believe there's been certain, uh, in at least some of the literature, it mentions trace amounts of, uh, I think, MTHBC and something else. Yeah. Uh, Psychotria alba is a plant that is uh, related to Psychotria viridis, which is much more commonly known. A number of botanists treat it as synonymous with uh, Psychotria carthaginensis. Um, however, the only difference between these two plants, uh, or the main difference, is the shape of the leaves and seeing as those particular structures can vary greatly depending on uh, humidity and other variables, it's not really ideal for making a botanical identification, and therefore I'll just be looking at differentiating Psychotria alba from Psychotria viridis. Uh, the, the plates on the left and the right represent, uh, or are thin layer chromatography plates that have a DMT standard run against uh, Psychotria alba and Alicia anisopetala, Initially, it was postulated that the two deposits for the uh, Psychotria alba and Alicia anisopetala were slightly lower than the DMT as a result of uh, plant impurities present. However, we just had this uh, particular, both of these plants analyzed by uh, high performance liquid chromatography, and it came back that these, in fact, do not match to either DMT or NMT. So for di differentiating Psychotria alba from Psychotria viridis, the main feature is the uh, flower petals. The Psychotria alba evidence is white petals. The Psychotria viridis evidence is green petals. Uh, however, because they're not always in bloom, there are a number of secondary characteristics that can be used to create a positive ID. Psychotria alba evidence is petioles, or leaf stalks, that attach the base of the leaf to the main stem whereas Psychotria viridis generally does not evidence petioles and has a full leaf margin. However, under certain conditions, uh, petioles can be observed, and therefore it's best to use in conjunction with a, a stipule identification. Uh, the stipule is this leaf-like structure that comes off of the leaf stem. Um, the Psychotria viridis structure is significantly larger and more ornate than the smaller and, and much plainer of the Psychotria alba. And finally, for a positive identification of Psychotria viridis, uh, at certain times, Psychotria viridis will evidence uh, dolmatias, foveolas, or espinas, which are these little spine-like structures coming off of the main leaf vein. And these are referred to as somewhat of a Goldilocks trait in that they'll only appear under perfect humidity, perfect lighting, and temperature. However, even in those conditions, they won't necessarily appear on all the leaves. Therefore, it's more useful for uh, confirming a positive identification of Psychotria viridis than initially establishing an identification. Alicia anisopetala leaves also came to our attention through mention of botanical vendors. Uh, once again, there's nothing in the literature on these. If you do a search on the plant, Google Scholar only returns the DMT nexus threads. Um, this came to our attention because it was actually sold as Diplopterus cabarana leaf, and people reported success with it. 
uh, leading us to conclude that perhaps there was DMT in it. However, uh, our thin layer chromatography and subsequent uh, high performance liquid chromatography indicate that there is no DMT in this, leading us to question what could potentially uh, be responsible for the psychoactive effects reported. Uh, we should have uh, gas chromatography results next week. Ayahuasca vine analogs refer to any plant that contain harmala alkaloids or more generally any plant that contains beta carboline alkaloids. Um, perhaps the best known and most widespread of these plants is Paganum harmala or Syrian rue. Uh, the seeds of this plant are generally contain uh, between three and six percent harmine and harmaline, although they can contain trace amounts of uh, tetrahydroharmine. They also contain quinazoline alkaloids, which have been uh, documented as being abortifacient, but may also present certain health benefits. However, for the purpose of uh, brewing ayahuasca analogs or taking uh, extracted alkaloids, they're seen as unwanted or at least extraneous to the, to the purposes intended, and therefore uh, many individuals use a Mansky extraction to separate the harmala alkaloids from the quinazoline alkaloids. Eliagnus angustifolia and Eliagnus uh, umbelata are two species commonly known as Russian olive and autumn olive. Uh, they contain a range of beta carboline alkaloids in very low quantities. However, uh, even though they don't contain harmine and harmaline, work with extracts from these plants has presented findings along the lines of their ability to potentiate. Uh, vaporized DMT as well as sublingual DMT and uh, based on those experience there has been conjecture that a, a brew from this particular or from either of these plants could potentially allow for DMT to be orally active. However, owing to their low alkaloid content, a significant amount of plant material would be needed and therefore more testing is awaiting. Uh, ayahuasca admixture analogs generally for the purposes of the nexus research refer to any plant that contains DMT. Acacia is a genus containing uh, numerous trees that present both high uh, DMT content as well as relatively clean alkaloid profiles. Um, our analyses has uh, shown that several species that have not been formally analyzed prior uh, do in fact contain DMT and that there is uh, significant amounts of beta carbolines in some of these species. Some of these species contain enough beta carbolines to be orally active on their own without the need for an admixture plant. Um, and finally, one of the more significant findings from this is that NMT is psychoactive. Individuals who have done extracts from acacias containing DMT and NMT report subjectively similar but different effects to uh, extracts that are solely DMT, and at least one individual has claimed to isolate NMT from an acacia species and presents it as being markedly different than DMT. Here is the uh, analysis for Acacia acuminata. This is the wide leaf phyllode variety. And the main alkaloid present is MTHBC, which is a beta carboline alkaloid, followed by DMT. Um, there are other uh, tryptamine and, and harmon present. Uh, this plant has been found to be orally active on its own without the need for admixture, and numerous people have bioassayed this plant and confirmed that. Uh, additionally, Acacia obtusifolia. Uh, twigs on the top and leaves on the bottom present remarkably similar alkaloid profiles uh, both to themselves and to uh, Mimosa hostilis root bark uh, between the, the DMT and two MTHB con MTHBC contents. What's really significant about this finding is that these analyses refer to the twigs and the leaf of this plant, showing that it's possible to uh, harvest pieces of the plant uh, that, unlike the bark, are not harmful to remove, therefore presenting the potentiality to grow and sustainably harvest uh, DMT sources without the need for uh, consumer relations or things of that nature, widespread uh, harvesting. When it comes to phalaris grass, I think the most significant point that I'd like to make is that wild grass is incredibly, incredibly variable in its alkaloid profile. 
Um, it contains a number of compounds, such as gramine and hordenine, for which there are uh, numerous questions regarding potential toxicity. Uh, and even though these compounds can be separated out using certain extraction procedures, generally speaking, we don't have enough information on the rest of the chemicals present within these grasses to present them as safe for consumption. There are a number of cultivars and clones that are available on the market that have been uh, found to have relatively clean alkaloid profiles and that have been documented in both uh, in their use for extraction as well as uh, brews. However, you know, again, I would just stress the fact that there's a lot of unknowns, especially when working with uh, wild Phalaris grass. If, however, you are intent on working with uh, these wild grasses, we would request that you use Mandalay, uh, Marquis or Mandolin reagent or other reagents to test for gramine content uh, in order to be sure that the product you're ingesting is relatively safe. Um, here are the, uh, the images of, of what different gramine contents with DMT look like from these grasses. Um, and finally, uh, with regards to Mimosa tenuiflora, which is perhaps the best known and, and most widely extracted plant source of DMT, um, our analysis has focused more on the extraction components as well as uh, jungle spice or jungle DMT, which is a phenomenon that's been reported on somewhat extensively in the underground community. Um, with regards to jungle spice, Many people have hypothesized that this dark red, waxy, or uh, gooey DMT product contains a host of other alkaloids beyond DMT, causing it to uh, generate experiences that are markedly different from pure DMT. However, our analysis of this particular extract showed that even after uh, dark red, waxy DMT had been theoretically exhausted by uh, hexane poles, it still contained 95% DMT and 5% MTHBC, which is the other beta carboline aside from uh, uh, DMTHBC presented within this particular plant, indicating one of two things, that either this relatively small amount of MTHBC is responsible for the wildly different effects of jungle spice, or that given the incredibly varied and powerful nature of the DMT experience, that it's simply self-suggestion that's causing people to uh, experience these different reports or different experiences when presented with this subjectively different looking DMT. Uh, finally, with regards to Mimosa tenuiflora, there was a major bust carried out by the DEA and Immigration's Customs Enforcement in September of 2012. Since that time, uh, mimosa tenuiflora root bark has been incredibly hard to find within the U.S., and many people have switched to using acacias. I think the main takeaway from this research, and as it proceeds into the future, is that there are so many plants in existence that contain DMT and harmal alkaloids and other entheogenic compounds that even if they continue this war on some people who use certain drugs, that... Um, you know, there's more than enough sources and that there's really no way to stymie this in any meaningful way. Thank you. Yes. Uh, do you have any stats on the uh, common acacia up here, the Baleana? We do. I don't have them. Mm. Sorry. Uh, the question was if there are any statistics for uh, DM DMT content in acacia baleana. Uh, we do have analysis on this. My recollection is that it does contain significant quantities of DMT. Uh, I would recommend that you check out the DMT nexus. We have, uh, there's an acacia analysis thread that has, it's probably over 20 species of acacia that are documented and discussed, uh, including mass spectrometry and uh, all sorts of hypotheses. Do you have any data on dismantus Illinois? We have some. We haven't. Uh, well, I guess our. Inf uh, sorry. Do we have uh, information regarding dismantus Illinoisensis? Um, we have had at least one member who has performed thin layer chromatography on that plant, and it seemed to indicate uh, a DMT content that uh, 
was, from my recollection, apparently fairly strong. I think it's been uh, reported in some of the literature to be about 1%. That's a plant that's on our list for uh, future analysis, as this project should be ongoing for quite some time. And impossible to eradicate since it's a pest throughout the Midwest. Exactly. It's, it's, yes, the, the point was that it's impossible to eradicate. It's a pest throughout the Midwest. It occurs all over. It's a very weedy plant, and it's most likely a very viable source of DMT, for whatever that might mean. One more question. I was struck by the small amounts of tetrahydro, uh, tetrahydro harming in your analysis since in ayahuasca it's a major component. Any comments on that? Sure. Uh, that was a question that I asked Ethan McElhenney the other day because his, or his results or uh, his numbers showed very high tetrahydroharmine contents for uh, ayahuasca brews. Uh, he and Jace Calloway have both presented papers indicating that uh, Harmine and harmaline can be reduced uh, from, you know, 2-harmaline and tetrahydroharmine. We've also seen that with the zinc reduction, it's quite possible to go from harmaline to tetrahydroharmine. So I would assume, and I'd really like to see if people like Jace and perhaps others could do analysis of their vines as well as their brews, because my uh, belief would be, at least preliminarily, that that's the result of the amount of boiling that it's... Exactly. Thank you.